So, good evening. Welcome to the LSE and welcome to this hybrid event. Um, my name is Kirsten Sainbruch. I'm the acting director of the Inequal International Inequalities Institute and a British Academy Global Professor at the Institute. So tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Liam Byrne, Professor Mike Savage, and Katie Schmucker to this event at the LSE. Liam, I'm sure, needs not much introduction, but he is the uh, Labour MP for Birmingham Hodge Hill, a member of His Majesty's Privy, Privy Council, elected chair of the Global Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and IMF, and chair of the House of Commons Business and Trade Select Committee. Mike Savage is the Martin White Professor of Sociology at the LSE, and he leads the Wealth, Elites, and Tax Justice theme, or research program, at the International Inequalities Institute. Katie Schmucker leads the Joseph Rowntree Foundation's work on destitution and deep poverty. She is also a member of the Scottish Poverty and Inequality Commission, which scrutinizes the Scottish government's progress on reducing poverty. So tonight, um, this event will discuss the new book by Liam Byrne, entitled The Inequality of Wealth, Why It Matters, and How to Fix It. And I can tell you it's a very good read with lots of very, very interesting details and practical examples. In this book, he explains the fast accelerating inequality of wealth, warns how it threatens our society, our economy, and our politics. And it shows where economics got it wrong, so there'll be much to discuss. And it also lays out, most importantly, a path back to common sense. So for Twitter users tonight, uh, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSEIII. The event is being recorded and will hopefully made available as a podcast subject to having no technical difficulties. And after the event and the discussants, we'll have some questions and um, hopefully an interesting discussion. So with that, I hand you over to Liam. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, hello everybody. It's absolutely marvellous to see you. It's, um, it's wonderful actually to be not talking about the post office um, just for a, a brief moment. Um, it, but it's a, it's, it's a great honour for me to be here um, to talk to you um, about a wonderful new book available in all good bookstores uh, and uh, outside. Um, but it's a great honour for me to be here back at the LSE, a place where your motto is to <coughs> discover the true causes of things, um, and of course, you were founded for the betterment of society. And that's what this book, I hope, is about. And what tonight gives me is a chance to um, share with you some of the thoughts and ideas, almost as a provocation to you, ahead of this big event that we've got coming up this year called a general election. Um, but, but also to say a huge thank you to many people here for the intellectual debts that I owe to you um, and to the LSE debts that I only know are going to increase tonight. So I'm not going to speak for, for very long. Um, Westminster is full of politicians who talk for too long. I've got friends that I've not spoken to for days because I just didn't want to interrupt them. Um, and so what, what I'm hoping to do tonight is, is just speak for about 20 minutes, which is... We say in Westminster is the average lifespan of a Tory Chancellor. So um, we, we, we will try and get through um, the basic argument, the theory of the case in the book, um, and some of the data that I discovered. Um, and you were kind enough to laugh just then. But, of course, the funny thing is that we in our country have been writing books about the wealth of our nation since this guy, who is Adam Smith. Wealth of Nations, published... 9th of March, 1776, so 248 years we have been having a discussion about the wealth of our nation. But the funny thing for me is I bet you, if you and I went out in the street tonight and asked people, what is the wealth of our nation, I bet they couldn't tell you, unless we wandered into the economics department and you will get three different figures. But by and large, people don't know what the wealth of our nation is, not least because it has multiplied so extraordinarily over the last few years. Now, 
That's been true over the course of my life. So since I was born in the holy town of Warrington back in 1970, the wealth of our nation has been transformed. So I don't, uh, I don't have any baby pictures. All the, the childhood pictures went into a, a skip, which I'll explain later. But I was born um, in 1970 to two fantastic parents, student radicals, um, met during the anti-apartheid movement, charging onto rugby pitches to stop the Springboks playing um, in English stadia. Um, and, you know, these star-crossed lovers, they were passionate about social progress. And that's why we had a household where we cared about things like inequality. But when you think about what has happened over the course of my life, since I was born in 1970, the wealth of our country has multiplied a hundredfold. Now, I don't think those two things are related, but the sharp-eyed amongst you, and there's plenty of you here at the LSE, will have noticed that for this period called austerity, the wealth of our country has practically doubled. And this, in a way, is the inconvenient truth. Because since I was born, for most of my life, Think about that little boy holding a football, practicing for Liverpool Football Club. For most of my life, the inequality, the equality of wealth, the way we shared wealth in this country, was getting fairer. But just look at what has happened um, since 2010. If you uh, look at what's happened since 2010, something fundamental has changed. So the top 1%, the luckiest in our society, have multiplied their wealth by around 31 times the wealth of everybody else. That is an extraordinary change in the way wealth is created and the way wealth is shared in our country. And in fact, the extremes of wealth inequality are now so extraordinary that um, you now see almost a, a Roman-style size of inequality now scarring our country. So one of the great books that I came across was by Walter Schneidel. Some of you will have read it. And Walter estimates that if you look at the fortunes of the richest Romans uh, all those years ago, at the most extremes, the biggest fortunes were worth uh, about one and a half million times the average uh, income in um, the Roman Empire. Well, look at what's happening now. Look at the wealth of the Hinduja family. The wealth of the Hinduja family, by best estimates, is about 1.3 million times the median UK salary. So at its extremes, things are now so bad, we're almost back uh, to those stages. Now, Walter is not an optimist about the future. He basically sets out two potential courses for fixing the inequality of wealth. He says, look, you've basically got war or you've got revolution. And let's be honest, in politics today, there are plenty of advocates for both of those two approaches. But for those of you who aren't in the market for war and revolution, you've got to ask yourselves, how are we going to rebuild now a coherent amity in our country that helps us avoid war and revolution and actually forges a path to a reformation of the way that our country works? Because when you um, look at some of the public polling data that we showcase in the book. This is data that has been put together um, by polling from the all-party group on inclusive growth, which I've chaired for the last 10 years. A few years ago, we asked people, right, who do you think is now the most powerful group? Who's the most powerful force? Who now runs our country? Who holds the power in our country? And by and large, people thought that it was national governments. Then we ran the poll again last year. And in the space of just a few years, the majority of people in our country now think that it is the top 1% that controls the most wealth in our country. So I don't know uh, what you watch on telly. I mean, I've had to watch the most extraordinary programs on telly just to research this book. So Above Deck, Below Deck, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, succession, many of you will see Succession or The Gilded Age. You know, what this, this kind of new genre on TV now that some call wealth porn is now kind of everywhere. But why is that? It's because our culture is telling us something. Our culture is reflecting an inner anxiety dream that many of us now have that is about how our nation, our world, is now controlled by the very rich rather than through a democracy. That, I would suggest, is a pretty significant problem. And that's my argument for why we need to think harder about what that reformation 
um, could look like. So, when you look at these extremes, when you look at the experience of the top uh, 1% and you look at what's happened to everybody else, it goes some way to explaining why we now have this moral emergency in our country, where on the one hand, we have the super rich that have frankly never had it so good. And um, I, I don't need to go on a poverty safari to understand what poverty looks like in our country, because my constituency in East Birmingham has the second highest unemployment, the worst child poverty, the worst fuel poverty, and food banks that are running out of food. What I did not know much about was how the other half lived. And so the book goes into some of the stories behind these statistics. Statistics that show that sales of Rolls-Royce cars are now at an all-time high. Sales of private jets are now pretty much at an all-time high. A couple of years ago, just after COVID, sales of super yachts were at an all-time high. We've not got one person, we've got three people now racing into space. And when you go and look at how these things are made, when you go and look at the million person hours of work that goes into a super yacht, it's an extraordinary thing. When you wander down Fillmore Gardens and you see people organizing swimming lessons in their swimming pools, in their basements, it's an extraordinary thing. When you wander around a Rolls Royce factory and see what you can now buy for a million quid, I'm not sure if anyone here is in the market. I can see a couple of people are in the market uh, for a car worth a million quid. But if you fancy a Rolls Royce now that has got a roof with a constellation on it that reflects the stars on the night you proposed to your loved one, no problem. They can do that. If you want your Rolls Royce to be the color of an Amazonian tree frog, no problem. If you want your Rolls Royce paint job to match the paint job on your private jets, they can now do that. But this is what I see in Birmingham. What I see in Birmingham is poverty that has never been this deep. These are the latest House of Commons figures about the release of food parcels into our country. Up and up and up. And yet, in our city, in Birmingham, in the last year alone, the issue of food parcels has gone up by another 40%. Another 40% on top of this. I now have a member of staff who helps organise food bank collections as part of our core constituency business. And the hunger is just as bad as the homelessness. Literally, in Britain's second city, in one of the richest countries on earth, it was just a few years ago that we had people dying on the street. Homeless people who were dying on the street. That's the moral emergency that our country now confronts. Now, the question is, what are we going to do about it? Because if you look around the world, countries that become unequal like ours have three things in common. They're poor, they're corrupt, and they're stagnant. They're poor because the very wealthy have a nasty habit of trying to hide their wealth to minimize the taxes that they pay. And if you think about that shower of papers that we've heard, you know, showers of papers named after sunny places like the Paradise Papers or the Panama Papers, they all basically tell one story, which is those with lots of wealth tend to try and hide it in order to minimize their tax take. But second, countries that are unequal quickly become countries that are corrupt. And I don't need to say much more than three letters, PPE, uh, and I don't mean the course that is taught upstairs. You know, these kind of corruption scandals are now bedeviling our country too. And of course, in unequal countries, social mobility begins to collapse. It now takes the heirs of somebody born poor in this country five generations to rise up and earn even average wages. And that's how bad things are today. But as bad as things are, as bad as the absurdity of affluence has now become, the thing that worries me most is not the conspicuous consumption of things and stuff and jets and Rolls Royces and super yachts. The thing that worries me most is not the conspicuous consumption. It's the inconspicuous consumption that you don't see in the corridors of power. I've been a member of parliament now for 20 years. I have never seen the money rolling through the corridors like I see it now today. And of course, it's not just money that goes into the political parties. It goes into TV stations, it goes into think tanks, it goes into newspapers. It builds an ecosystem that tries to bend, shape, adapt the climate of opinion to suit a particular kind of politics. And if it carries on like this, things, frankly, will go from bad to worse. I started my political career um, in Millbank Tower in 1996. We used to bounce to work singing, things can only get better. 
And of course, the longer I've been in politics, the more I've come to understand that things can also get worse. And if you think things are bad today, think about what's about to come. We are now on the brink of the biggest transfer of wealth in our country's history. Nothing's forever, including the baby boomers. And as the baby boomers die, they will bequeath five and a half trillion pounds to their heirs. And some people will inherit fortunes, but some people will inherit care bills. And so the inequality, the wealth inequality that we see today is as of nothing compared to what is about to come. And so Gen Z, this extraordinary generation born since the turn of the century, including number three child uh, in the third row back, is about to become the most unequal generation for half a century. And if you care about the stability of politics, if you care about justice, if you care about a productive, functioning country in the future, that must be something that troubles you. So that is the kind of the background of the book. And again, the politics of this is pretty straightforward. This is a bit of a poll that we did last year too, where we were looking at how do people feel about the wealth gap in British politics today. And you can see that getting on for 70%, it's just over 70% of people now say the wealth gap is much, much too large. When you then look, when you then poll on the question, do you therefore think it needs to come down, the number comes down a little bit, but you're still talking about two-thirds of the British public that thinks that the wealth gap in our country has now got to come down. So, what are we going to do about it? It's particularly appropriate to ask this question here. Um, it was the challenge that Tony Atkinson uh, gave to Thomas Piketty. Piketty's great book, 10 years ago, transformed the debate about this around the world. But Tony Atkinson's challenge was, what are you going to do about it? What is the policy prescription? How do you make sure that you're not just someone who is wringing your hands? How are you actually going to affect change instead? And so in the all-party group on inclusive growth, what we try and do is try and find the overlapping consensus between left and right about how we fix it. But I became increasingly convinced that it's wealth inequality that we've got to fix. And that then took me to somebody who spent an awful lot of time here. It's particularly appropriate to launch the book here because the intellectual framework for the policy answers is derived from one of the greatest economies of the 20th century, James Mead. He spent a significant part of his career here at the LSE. The work that he did here at the LSE was fundamental to him going on to win um, the Nobel Prize. And um, very few people, I got this book out of the House of Commons Library. I was the first person to get this book out of the House of Commons Library for about 20 years. But Mead's book on wealth inequality, written in the early 1960s, gives you a really good framework for thinking about how you fix wealth inequality. And I'll spare you the equation, but what Mead basically tells you is that if you're worried about wealth inequality, you've got to worry about income, you've got to worry about the savings rate, you've got to worry about the returns that people get on savings, and of course, you've got to worry about tax. Now, where that takes me as a politician, and what politician doesn't love a five-point plan, is it takes me to these basic five arguments. And none of these ideas are radical. None of them are especially innovative. Each of these ideas have been tried somewhere in the world. And this is an important part of the debate because we're at the stage now where we can't simply offer ideas that people will like on social media. We've got to ask what are the ideas that people will vote for in a general election. So here's a basic five-point plan. We've got to raise the rate of growth. We've got to do that not just in London and the South East. We've got to do it everywhere. We've got to act to raise earnings. Universal basic capital is the argument I arrive with rather than universal basic income. Commonwealth fund, a sovereign wealth fund for the UK and restoring fairness to the tax system. Let me start with growth because it's going to be the key topic at the next election and it's the core of the work that we now do on the Business and Trade Committee at the House of Commons. Ultimately, if we want to give Britain a pay rise, we have to raise the number of good paying jobs, not just somewhere, but everywhere. Knowledge intensive jobs, that doesn't just mean working in a chip factory. It doesn't just mean look, working in high tech manufacturing. Knowledge intensive jobs can be in any part of the economy. But here's the problem. Half of the knowledge economy jobs, half the knowledge intensive jobs that we create today are in London and the South East. When you look at the kind of job numbers that we're creating in most parts of the country, they're much, much too low to supply opportunities for people to get a pay rise. Why is that important? Because knowledge intensive jobs pay a third more than the average job in our country. But the only way that we can change these kind of numbers is by building a modern supply side economic where we give radical devolution of power and resource to every part of the country to build the institutions that help them mobilize people, ideas, and money, like my region, 
um, in the West Midlands. Second, it's not just enough to raise the rate of growth. We have to raise pressure on earnings. This is um, a graph that basically shows how has the national income been divided since 1955. And you can see the top blue line is the, the fraction of national income that is going to workers compared to capital. It's not been going up. It's been going down. And part of the reason it's been going down is that we permit, we tolerate, we allow, we license a race to the bottom amongst companies in this country that we've got to start avoiding. But here's the irony. We're all funding those companies with two trillion pounds worth of pension savings. We're putting the money into those companies. Now, you may not like it, but right now you've got no way of knowing whether you're putting your pension savings into companies that are screwing their workers, dodging their taxes, and poisoning the planet. So we need a civic capitalism in this country that brings together, harnesses the power of pension savers, rolls up the 32,000 different pension funds into a handful of super funds like Australia and Canada, and actually allows you as a pension saver to start investing money in good companies, not bad companies. That is one of the ways that we can build a civic capitalism in our country. Third, we then have to think, if we've raised growth, if we've raised earnings, how do we then raise savings? And this is where I became attracted to this notion of universal basic capital. Many of you, especially if you are living in London, you will know that we now live pretty much in an inheritocracy. What you inherit basically now dictates how well you're going to do in life. And um, I don't know how many fans there are of Kirsty Allsop in this room. There's going to be a couple, no doubt makes good programs, but some of you will remember Kirsty Allsop's advice to the Gen Zs amongst us that, look, if you want to buy a house, it would just be much better for you um, if you stopped buying Starbucks and, um, you know, cancelled the gym membership and maybe cancelled Netflix. And, of course, I think it was, she denied the interview later on, um, but the, um, the wisest in the, in the newspaper sort of said, well, look, if you really want to move to where housing is more affordable, probably the best place to move would be back to the 1970s. But the problem is pretty fundamental. And so if you then think why this is now so difficult, back in the 1970s when I was born, the, the, the wealth of the country was about three times national wages. Now it's 10 times national wages. What does that mean? It means if you don't own assets now, if you don't have assets now, then you are in real trouble because asset prices are now far, far more expensive. And Kirsty Allsop's advice, I'm afraid, is not going to figure out an answer to that problem. So universal basic capital takes the idea of a universal savings account. It's just been pioneered as what's called a sidecar account from the National Endowment and Savings Trust. It says that everybody should get one when they start work. We should link it to your auto-enrollment pension account. We should link it to your lifelong learning accounts. And in a way, we could allow you to then build more productively your housing capital, your, your knowledge capital, and your pension capital for the future. But for those without anything, we should be changing our tax system to help you. Because when you look at what Richard Titmuss called fiscal welfare, you can see the numbers are obvious. We put about £70 billion of money into subsidising and helping those who have already got assets. It is the principle that James Mead identified as to those that have shall be given. And it is the most regressive system of tax incentives that you can imagine. It needs a fundamental overhaul. But I guess the argument that I conclude with is that to really galvanise universal basic capital, we should take an idea from the Intergenerational Commission, which was about actually providing a £10,000 dividend to every young person at the age of 25 to help them get a foot on the housing ladder. It's something that if you give that money to young people as a savings match or a tax break, the su political support for it goes off the scale. If you give the money as cash, it's not a greatly popular idea. Give it in a different way, it's far, far more popular. Why £10,000? Well, it happens to be the average shortfall on a deposit for a home in our country. It's not a substitute for building more homes, but it is a way of making sure that we begin to democratise access to assets in our country. And do you know what? We could actually provide that dividend if we hadn't given away the proceeds of naughty oil back in the 1970s. If we had not given that money away, we would have a sovereign wealth fund like the canny Norwegians that would be worth half a trillion pounds. So let's learn the lesson from the past and let's build a Commonwealth Fund today to provide those dividends 
for the future. The state has got all kinds of assets, by the way. It's got everything from a lovely wine cellar underneath Lancaster House, uh, shares in football clubs. I think during COVID, the Chancellor invested in a, um, a, an international uh, small company that organised international sex parties called Killing Kittens. I think we still own the shares for that. But the point is that there are assets all over the public domain that you could brigade together. And do you know what? You could top them up by restoring fairness to the tax system. Now, I don't know how many people here have read Rishi Sunak's tax return. Put your hand up. Aaron Advani, anyone else? <laughs> right, well, it's lucky I've done it for you. Um, so this is Rishi Sunak's tax return. Uh, it's one page, so it's a summary. And um, it basically shows that Rishi Sunak has an income of about two million. Anyone want to guess the tax rate on that? Aaron isn't allowed to comment. Anyone want to guess the tax rate on? 23%. Two million pounds in, 23% tax. At a time when one in five people in our country are paying 40% tax. Now, that's a problem in and of itself, right? But it's a particular problem because of the way our economy has changed. The grey bars are the wealth of the country. Um, 12 trillion quid. It's enough to build a path of gold bars, five bars wide, from John O'Groats to Land End. The green line is investment income. It's doubled over the course of this century. It's now about 80 billion pounds. But guess what? Who gets all that money? Well, we don't really know, but the House of Commons <coughs> Library reckons nearly 60% of that investment income goes to the top 10%. But they then pay half the rate of tax of everybody else. Quids in. And of course, when I put this question to Rishi Sunak at Liaison Committee just before Christmas, his answer was, yeah, well, it was Gordon Brown who designed the system, so it's all fine. <laughs> now, that is the argument. Let's think together about how we change the inequality of wealth in our country. There are ideas from around the world that we could put together in a framework. Creative states, civic capitalism, universal basic capital, a commonwealth fund for the future, a tax code that actually reflects our moral code. These are ideas that may not be so radical they're impossible, but they are plausible enough for people to vote for. And maybe I've got these ideas wrong. Fine, it's a provocation. Come and tell me what ideas would make more difference in the future and on the other side of a general election. The final point I wanted to make was actually to end on a, on a note of um, optimism. Uh, because when my kids read the draft of the book, they were a bit worried it was a little bit kind of pessimistic. And so I wanted to end on a note of optimism. And that's the, the conclusion to the book. Think about the changes in the years ahead. Think about what is already happening before our eyes. Think about the way that things you saw in science fiction are now in real life. It's not HG Wells anymore, it's Tunbridge Wells. Think what's going to happen with artificial intelligence or genetic medicine or global gigabit connectivity or the transition to green energy. We're going to add something like 100 trillion to global wealth by 2060. The question for us is where does that wealth go? If we think, if we act, we could use those new possibilities to transform the agency, the options, the opportunities for everybody in this country. We could actually provide a different kind of freedom for people in the 21st century. But as Roosevelt understood, if you want to expand the frontiers of freedom, you need security. And there is no security without wealth. And that's why we, together, as good people who care about the future, have got to answer this question. How do we now rebuild that old ideal, an ideal that is as old as Plato, an ideal that was once shared on left and right? It's about how we now rebuild the wealth-only democracy. And I hope this book gives you food for thought. Thanks very much indeed. Liam, um, that's a wonderful, stimulating, interesting presentation. I'm now going to hand over to Mike, who is Thank going you. to be doing the first set of comments. Is this so the slide? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Oops. 
So thank you so much. And um, so I'm a sociologist. I'm a sociologist of social change. And um, I have about this long-standing interest, going right back to the 1980s, about how the Labour Party and how the Labour movement is a force for progressive social change. So going back 40 years, my PhD, which became you know, my first book, was reflective on how, if we are to get the, the progressive, positive change which Liam outlined, the Labour movement has to be part of that. Now, I have to say, at the outset, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. I haven't always voted Labour, in fact. Um, but I'm, I really want to, uh, firstly, <coughs> a applaud this book, but it's a really important work of public intellectualism for the Labour Party. Because there is this amazing tradition, and I've been you know, studied it in the past, this amazing tradition of uh, Labour Party intellectual thinking, which brings together an understanding of our society in all its complexity, with a concern to actually think positively about how we can bring about policy intervention and also engage a wider public. You know, I'm thinking of people like Tony Crossland and great intellectuals like Michael Foote, uh, Tony Benn, Gordon Brown. I have to say, I think across the political scene, many of us have been somewhat depressed about the level of political debate we've had in this country. Um, I think what's fantastic about this book, and what I wasn't sure, what, when Liam asked me to speak and when he was keen for me to read the book, I wasn't quite sure to, I would, to expect what I think is, is a really, really important contribution because Liam is seeking to take the inequality debate in, into a, a more mainstream, progressive direction, which I think we, we massively need in the um, public debate. So I just want to quickly um, go back to some of the two main points, both of which, uh, particularly his first point, you know, um, Liam mentioned. But, but I just want to underscore this. So this is a similar graph to the one Liam had taken from the, the uh, economists in Paris about you know, the average <laughs> national wealth in the UK. And the way I think about it um, here, is that it took us many millennia to get to £100,000 per head. You know, from the dawn of time, we reached this £100,000 of wealth per head in around the 1980s. Then 30 odd years later, we doubled that. It's an incredible social transformation, which we haven't really got our heads around. People don't really understand, I don't think sociologists understand what the stakes of what we have seen in the last 30 or 40 years. And as Liam pointed out, one of the reasons we haven't come to terms with this is because it is a very small proportion of the population which has reaped the benefits of this. Um, it's with this wealth inequality, for the reasons he laid out, the distributions are so uneven that the vast majority of this increase are captured by 10%, 1%. And we have, we have been, uh, most people have not experienced it. I like this graph, which also comes from the Piketty School, which maps the proportion of wealth against the national income. And it's got this famous U-shape curve. I mean, it, I talk about this in my book, which tries to reflect one of these broader trends. And I like, this, I like this argument because other sociologists, whenever people say, you know, we're living in this dynamic, you know, accelerating society, and we just, everything's changing every day, I think actually, no, not, not really, because the return of wealth, the return of capital, the return of accumulated resources, is really taking us back to the Victorian age, and indeed, I mean, as, as Liam pointed out, before that too, these historic eras of aristocracies of elites. And that, what that brings with it, therefore, is actually a highly conservatizing society. So I take a lot of the discussion around you know, innovation with a bit of a pinch of salt, because really we're living in a world in which the, the forces of inheritance, of ascription, of elitism is, are becoming more powerful and more marked. But I also think this graph is important because we have to see ourselves now in the 21st century as back in the kind of pre-First World War period. And that pre-First World War period was, of course, um, an age when we had this very interesting liberal government between 1906, 1910, which actually was premised on a very 
interesting critique of wealth inequality from a kind of liberal leftist position. And in many respects, I think what Liam is doing in this book is returning to that critique exactly the way it was mobilized um, 120, 130 years ago. And this new, this new liberal critique, which is not a socialist critique, so I think you know, for, those of us, for those of us in the room who are socialists, which I include myself, we, we don't need to be persuaded about this, I don't think. But that's not enough. That's not going to be enough to win the election. We need to persuade this more middle ground, more liberal, if you like, more, more um, median voter constituency. This is what we need to do. In that period before the First World War, the Liberal government won elections because they said wealth is produced <coughs> collectively. It's a communal activity. The only reason why wealth accumulation is happening is because it's, we're all doing it together. So therefore, wealth assets, wealth acquisition, wealth accumulation cannot simply be treated as a private good. And the argument was, therefore, in fact, first professor of sociology at LSE, Lionel Hophouse, who were lots of leaders about this for the Manchester Guardian, this was the main point. There is a right to tax wealth because it is produced by collect collectivity. And I think what Liam is doing is reinstating that kind of argument, that we need to think about um, a community-centred critique of wealth and equality. What that means, I think, is shifting the debate a bit away from pure economic distributions. So I think a lot of the critique of wealth and equality, looking at of Piketty and these really important scholars who Liam engages with, is talking about the distribution, and of course we know it's massively uneven. But that's not enough, I don't think, to really win the public argument. We have to go beyond that and talk about the way in which the institutional structures um, reward certain kinds of rent-seeking, unproductive behaviour, and that is really, all of us need to be engaged with that, including people who are pretty wealthy, actually. And I think that's what Liam's book really opens up that argument. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to restate uh, the points which Liam put out so eloquently about universal capital and sovereign wealth funds. To me, they're, they're, they, I'm completely convinced that they are really significant. Um, the way in which we need to think about tackling the dominance of London, and I think we, some of us were at a seminar last week here at the LSE on tackling financial secrecy. Bring, uh, showcasing work we've been doing around, you know, and we had Margaret Hodge from the Labour Party <laughs> speaking at that event too. The UK is the centre of dirty money in the world, different ways, and it works, it works out in all sorts of ways through tax havens, through the use of trust mechanisms. We have a global responsibility to tackle wealth here because actually we are culpable globally for what is happening in this country and the way we are complicit with these global inequalities. So uh, this is a public duty we have, which is really about extending the way we challenge wealth inequality. I want to say, I want to finish, just about this issue of tax. Actually, Liam skipped over a bit about tax. He talked a lot about um, sovereign wealth funds and um, universal basic capital. I agree with all that, but... I think you, you talked about you know, the need for just taxes. And obviously, we do have this big debate now about should there be a wealth tax, and which, which Liam covers very fairly and very reasonably um, in his book. And Aaron Advani is here, and he's here, Andy Summers have played a major role in pushing this argument out there. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I completely agree with um, Liam that wealth taxes are not the only thing. We shouldn't fixate on wealth tax. Again, going back to this new Liberal government of the 1906 period, which was, you know, in many ways, the foundation of the welfare state, they, they, they had a multiple approach to this. I mean, very interestingly, what the, I think the 1907 Liberal government did is they increased the rate of taxation on uh, unearned income, so it's almost double the rate of earned income. So going back to the Mishi Sunak example. Um, so basically, trying to think about capital gains... Well, in the Liberal case, it was capital gains equivalent was much higher than the income tax. Why do we not tackle those sorts of issues? Um, I, but I do want to just press Liam a bit, a bit on the wealth tax. So I think, you, I think it's, you, you're very fair about it. Uh, I do think there's an argument for symbolically, as well as purely in terms of raising money, having a debate about the wealth tax and some kind of commitment to thinking about taxation of wealth is an important 
repertoire. And I think the question at the bottom here, um, you know, we, have a safety, we have a very safety first, risk averse Labour Party currently. Now, when we all know the reasons for that. We don't want the current government to carry on with us any longer. But there's also an argument that, as again, I think the, the data you showed, Liam, that the public opened this. The public know that wealth inequality is unfair. It's not as if there's scepticism about the case, but you do need leadership. And, it's up, and surely the role of political parties is to lead these debates as well as to sort of what, keep a watch out there. So I do hope that what you've done in this book is you've opened up this middle ground, this kind of, you, you return to a more, I think we even call yourself a Blairite at one point. Yeah, you, you, you've brought kind of Blairite camp into this the discussion about wealth and equality. I do think we also need to kind of keep the issue of wealth taxation as a serious issue for us to talk about. Thank you. much, Mike. I'm sure Liam will be delighted to answer that last question and discuss further. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Katie, who will provide the second set of comments. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, so, for those of you who don't know the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, we are an independently endowed social change organisation with a mission to end poverty in the UK. And I think um, Liam's book makes a really compelling case for rebuilding or building a wealth-owning democracy. But I think the thing that I want to sort of put in my comments um, this evening is that we can't build a wealth-owning democracy unless we have a firm foundation to build from. And absolutely core to that is people's ability to be able to meet their most basic physical needs. But, shamefully, there are millions of people in our country at the moment for whom that is not a given. And if you've nothing left at the end of the week, if you're having to visit a food bank, um, if you are struggling to keep the roof over your head, you can't even really begin to think about things like building up savings, like um, investing in yourself, like taking a risk on a new business, or buying a house. So we need to think about how to set the foundations that enable us to build the economic security and enable people to begin to accumulate assets in order that, you know, because from that we know flows dignity, flows freedom, and hope for the future. But you know, we're in a very challenging place right now. Not only do we have widespread poverty in our country, the poverty that people are experiencing is also growing more severe. One of the measures that we look at at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation is a measure of what we call very deep poverty. So that's people with less than 40% of median income after housing costs. So that's quite a substantial way below the sort of standard relative poverty line. And the latest data shows that there are around 6 million people who are in very deep poverty in 2021-22. Uh, 1.5 million of them were children. And that is um, a number that has grown <coughs> quite substantially over time. In the last 20 years, the number of people in very deep poverty has grown by 1.5 million, from 4.5 million to 6 million. And you can sort of see it in this slide, which shows the gray sort of block at the bottom is people in very deep poverty. Um, the whole area is people in poverty. And you can see that sort of dark gray slide kind of creeping up over time as we've seen this deepening of poverty. But it's not just um, that that we're seeing. We see all kinds of other warning signs all around us. Um, also at JRF, we monitor uh, destitution, so that is an even more severe measure when people are unable to meet their most basic physical needs, to be warm, to be dry, to be clean, to be fed. And here we see there are 3.8 million people who at some point during 2022 were unable to meet that standard. 
3.8 million people experiencing destitution in our country. One million of them were children. And again, we see a really alarming picture of very rapid growth. So, doesn't want to show you that graph. Um, over the space of five years between 2017 and 2022, we saw the number of people experiencing destitution more than double and the number of children experiencing destitution nearly tripled. And such hardship on this scale has a terrible impact on people's lives. But rather than me talk about it, I should warn you, this is quite a tough listen. We had to provide proof that our daughter had been born. At the time, we had no finances to pay for her birth certificate. I know it's only 11 pounds, but we were lucky if we could scrape together one pound. We were relying on food banks to have food in our cupboards. Universal Credit wouldn't accept me bringing my daughter in as proof enough that my daughter existed. I only eat one meal a day. I'll probably have a bit of toast when I get home from work, but I tend to just eat at night time because I can't afford to buy things for me to eat during the day. Food banks only give you three days of supply and the area I'm in, they're only open on Mondays and Tuesdays. So by Friday, I'm out of food. I went without washing powder for two weeks. I didn't do any washing for two weeks. I've still got a little bit of shampoo from the church. They tend to have shampoo while they have hand wash and toilet rolls. You're allowed one toilet roll a week. I mean, my gas and electric. I've not paid that for over a year. I can't even touch it. I owe them thousands. But it's a kind of a uh, case of, do I pay that or do I go and buy food? We was in debt a lot because we couldn't afford to pay the bills. Council tax, fuel, water. We had to get payday loans out to try and survive. And it all escalated too much, basically. I sometimes have to borrow of my mum for toiletries. My eldest daughter, her disability, she's incontinent at night time, so she has to wear nighttime pads. They're not covered on the NHS. I have to purchase them myself. They're eight pounds for 12 pads. My son has to go to the hospital to be reviewed for his medication. We have to get a train. He goes free. Then, obviously, it's like a day out. I have to buy him lunch because I have to take him out of school early. He has to go out every few weeks. It's like three pounds something there and then back. I know it's not a lot, but it is when you only get 50 pounds a week. things that people told us in the course of doing the research into destitution in the UK. Um, and I think, you know, it's not controversial to say that hardship on that scale does not belong in a wealthy country like ours. It's clearly morally wrong, but it actually has implications way beyond just the individuals who are concerned. It's bad for our economy and it's bad for public services as well. You know, it stunts the um, spending power in the here and now. Low-income people without money in their pockets are not spending money in their local economies. It hampers investment in the future. 
when your mental bandwidth is taken up with where your next meal is coming from, you're not thinking about training, you're not thinking about um, hunting for a new job. It's difficult to find a space to think about, you know, a business startup. And our economy is denied talent and opportunity as a result of that. And rising hardship increase, increases pressure on public services as well. <coughs> so poverty breeds ill health, it takes a toll on mental health, and it's not conducive to child development or learning. All of these things are costs that we are carrying as a country. And we ended up here after a decade of cuts and freezes to social security, high housing costs, poorly paid and precarious jobs, an employment support system that focuses on hectoring people rather than engagement and motivation, minimal household savings, throw into that mix a pandemic, a cost of living crisis, and you have a recipe for rising hardship. And I think it's no accident, actually, that a lot of those themes are the very same ones that Liam is talking about in his book. Um, and I think, you know, Liam's book really shows that there is no shortage of good ideas about what you might do in order to strengthen the foundations to be able to build um, a wealth-owning democracy. And I think, just to close briefly, I'd just like to sort of build a little on three of the recommendations that Liam makes in his book. Um, I think yeah, the, the part about good jobs is absolutely fundamental and I agree with the ideas around sort of purposeful business and institutional investing that, um, that Liam talks about as having key roles. I mean, I'd add to that mix thinking about um, sort of unions and kind of employee organisation. Uh, I'd also add to that anchor organisations like local authorities and the NHS and universities and thinking about how they can use the capital that they have, the sort of spending power and the employment power that they have in their local economies in order to be uh, maximising the number of good jobs that there are. <laughs> thinking about housing, Liam touches a bit on um, sort of ways in which we might be able to fund more social house building. And... Um, Alongside that, I would add that clearly more social housing is absolutely fundamental in terms of more affordable housing for people. But as alongside thinking about just the new build, I think we also need to be having a serious conversation about how we shift tenures towards those that provide more security for people and are more affordable within our existing housing stock. And one thing that we've been thinking about at JRF is the role that acquisition of private rented properties might play in that and converting them into social housing, beginning in those areas which are plagued by extractive and absentee landlords who you know, are attracted by low entry costs and high returns, um, but these are often places where there are um, really serious problems of poor management. And then finally, um, the absolute bedrock has to be that people can afford life's basic essentials. And I'm grateful to, to Liam for the, uh, for the mention in the book of um, the work that we have been doing with the Trussell Trust around the idea of an essentials guarantee and universal credit. Because our social security system should be there for any one of us when we fall on hard times. But by our calculation, the current basic rate of universal credit, which is eight, currently £85 per week, for those of you who don't know, um, we calculate that that falls a whopping £35 per week short of what is needed just to cover a basket of basic goods and services like food and basic household bills, cleaning products and toiletries. So we would argue that we need to build an essentials guarantee into universal credit so that there is a protected minimum in the system and it is always enough to uh, afford life's essentials. So in summary, it's kind of not rocket science a job that pays, a home you can afford, a social security system that has your back when things go wrong in life. Starting there, we can then strengthen the foundations which enable us to build a wealth-owning democracy because then people can begin to start to think about things like asset accumulation. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three speakers. Those were very powerful presentations with some very powerful themes. Um, 
we, we are going to start on the discussion part of the evening and uh, we'll take some questions. So we're going to actually start the other way around this time. We're going to ask some um, questions that have been asked online and then take some questions from the room. Just before I do do that, um, I just wanted to let you all know that outside of the room, we'd like to invite you to a reception afterwards and also Liam's books um, will be on sale. There's a store outside so that you can read his book in more detail. Um, Peter, are you giving me some questions? Yep. So we've got three questions online. Uh, the first one is from BJ Srao, who asks, given the UK does not have a sovereign wealth fund like Norway's, how important is it for legislators to make statements which maintain the credit worthiness of the UK and inspire confidence in investors? The second question, anonymous question, um, would reindustrialization of the UK economy with more manufacturing, coal mining, shipbuilding, and steel making decrease inequality in the Midlands and the north of the UK? Um, third anonymous question, the production of more wealth surely depends on increased use of resources, which has escalated environmental crises. Um, in the context of the climate crisis, would a form of degrowth economics uh, do more for our communities and planet? Thank you. Should I start? Yeah. Yeah, okay. great. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for those. Um, so on the, the degrowth economics, I think, is um, it, it's challenging for me as somebody who serves the poorest community in the country because actually to, what, what degrowth would mean to most of my constituents is uh, a worse deal. Um, and so, like many people here, I suspect, I was deeply influenced by some of the work of Kate Raworth. Um, and the, that last slide I put up about freedoms, um, for me, was my kind of answer to that. Because, you know, in, in politics, we talk about these big ideas like freedom and social justice. But... If, if you're serious about equality, which is what the Labour Party was founded to promote, you've got to answer the question, well, equality of what? And actually, it's been a long time since people on the left had said, well, we believe in an equality of freedoms, and then gone on to set out what those freedoms might look like. But you've got to root that within the kind of frameworks that Kate proposes, so that you're not just kind of busting through some of these kind of ecological ceilings in a way that destroys the planet um, and indeed the future for our children. Um, and I try and bring that out in the book. I think probably the, one of the bits that was missing, um, my, one of my editors is here, so I'll be, I'll be kind, but I mean, we, I couldn't get too far into the green debate and if there was a bit that I think was missing, there was definitely a bit missing on, on carbon taxes. And so um, hopefully if you keep making that point tonight, I'll get commissioned to do the follow-up volume to <laughs> Um, to this, they can get into that. On reindustrialization, so this is a really important point. And the point here is that the British economy is a big economy. And the kind of industrial policy that we need in the West Midlands, do you know what? It's different to the industrial policy that you would need in London or indeed the South East. But our country is so rigid today, we've got no freedom and flexibility to build the kind of institutions that would work for, say, the automotive industry in the West Midlands. Um, and that's partly because we've got such a centralised fiscal regime. So at the moment, about £80 billion is spent across 140 different programmes, all decided in Whitehall. They're on different timetables, they've got different targets, they're run from different departments. £80 billion. That's way more than the money that we actually devolve to mayors, which is about £800 million. So you know, we've got to kind of just let go. We've got to get Whitehall out of the mix. We've got to actually give local places the freedom to build the institutions that would work for their regional economies. And that actually, I think, is the fastest route um, to reindustrialization. On sovereign wealth funds, yeah, you know, it's really important that we don't have chancellors that just go a little bit crazy, like um, some of those chancellors that you can remember. Um, unfunded, massive tax cuts for those who have already got quite a lot, generally a bad idea generally doesn't do much for your credit worthiness. But the point about sovereign wealth funds is an interesting one. 80 countries have got sovereign wealth funds now around the world. Um, the average return on those funds is about 8% a year. 
So if you're trying to democratise access to the best returns, sovereign wealth funds are a really good way of doing that because for most people without money, and remember, this is JRF research, uh, about a quarter of the people in this country have net savings of less than £100. And many of them will be facing finance costs rather than healthy returns on the money that they invest. So how, therefore, do you democratise access to the best returns? Sovereign wealth funds is one of the ways to do it. If 80 countries around the world can do it, then I think we can do it too. Thank you so much. Right, we're now going to turn to questions in the room. I see a lot of hands already. <laughs> OK, um, gentlemen here. I'll take um, about three questions and then you can answer them. A uh, gentleman here in the second row. Uh, thank you. My name is Antonius from the UCL. Thank you for the great discussions. My question is for the voters, how to differentiate that this is a problem of a political economic system, like we are trapped in the free market capitalism or like a populism that also uh, powered by the social media, or is it a policy uh, making problem? So uh, uh, how to differentiate those, those kind of problems? And how, if it is a systemic problem, how true that this is the policy making mechanism we can like uh, fight back and create the, 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 the more equal society? Thank you very much. A gentleman in the green shirt, and then I see a green arm, but I think a blue shirt over there. Hi, I'm Angela from LSE. Thank you for the talk. Amazing book. I have to read it yet, but I will. Uh, so my question is more about the wealth tax or uh, related policies and the political economy of it. Uh, because we also had a similar discussion in Italy, but because the economy in Italy is not going very well and UK is in a similar situation, many politicians and analysts started to say, why are we talking about a wealth tax when we don't even, we are not even growing? Like we are in a recession and we are talking about taxing more. So that's, I mean, it, it not it's not necessarily my opinion, but I'm thinking about all the obstacles, political economy obstacles of this uh, policy, and then also the investment power of the the people that would be taxed. Many many times we hear, if you tax the very richest, maybe they will just withdraw their money from UK, they will go somewhere else, they will invest somewhere else, and suddenly all the discussions about wealth tax disappear. <laughs> so I was wondering what's your op opinion about this? Thank you. The gentleman behind him then. Next round is gonna be uh, ladies only of questions. <laughs> After the Hello, Jamie Knight. Uh, I just want to reiterate that um, the one percent the super wealthy could take their money elsewhere to another country or that tax exiles. Um, so it's a global problem actually of capital that's so freely movable across the world. And also the city of London uh, at the root of the problem is not providing goods and services, it is to make money out of money. And that is where we are concentrating our resources in this country and it's not right. Thank you. Thank you. Liam. Great. Well, I, it, that's, um, uh, we've been quite quick to get into the tax question and that is a good thing because the, the reality is, as was brilliantly set out, that the tax is the root of all progress because money is the root of all progress. And if you think about what's happened to our country over the last 13 years, and I, Gary Stevenson is here, who might want to say something about this in a sec, but you know, one of, one of the, the things that Gary has done just such a brilliant job at exposing is if you think about the 850 billion pounds that we put into quantitative easing, that knocked about 1% off interest rates. 
Lower interest rates probably contributed about four-fifths of the gains in wealth over the last decade and a bit. But add on to that much of the money that went out the door during COVID, and you then ask yourself, okay, well, where did that money go to? And, and the truth is, much of that money has gone to those who already had a lot of assets. Yet there's been no windfall tax on any of that. Now, Andy Summers, Aaron Abani, Gary are at the forefront of the debate on wealth tax. And what's been brilliant about their work is the clarity with which they've laid out the options. So ending non-DOMS tax breaks, charging um, national insurance on investment income, equalizing the rates of tax on income um, and capital gains. And then I think the big insight from the Wealth Tax Commission was that the best way to levy a wealth tax is to actually pick a very small number of people. So those with fortunes of over 10 million, it's about 22,000 of those, and say you have a 1% tax on those. Now, if you put all those together, you're at about 40 billion, broadly speaking. So look, a billion here, a billion there, so you're talking about real money. Now, I think the political argument for this is going to become unstoppable. Now, in the book, you know, full confession, I pulled a punch on the 1% wealth tax because I think there is some work to do actually putting together the data on who actually has the wealth and where is that wealth. But the point about capital mobility is, is interesting because actually the Wealth Tax Commission's work shows that actually the capital doesn't flee because investors like things like rule of law, good education system, good universities. There are lots of things to actually keep people connected in Britain. And so the, the concerns about capital flight are a little bit overdone. The point about political economy though is so important because the, the, the middle of the book goes into, I'm afraid, what is an unfortunate truth about our country, which is that we live in a gerontocracy. About 40% of people who will vote at the next election will be over the age of 55. Now, that means that if you're to make progress on tackling the inequality of wealth, you've got to build alliances between many people in the top 10% and people in the bottom 90%. But the polling work that we've done and Aaron and others have done shows that there is now a majority of support for some of those wealth tax proposals. And so it's difficult to make tax policy in opposition. It's not something I'd recommend because you can never quite work out exactly who all the losers going to be and that creates kind of political risks. But un unless we can build this multi-generational alliance on tax, then we won't get a government that is actually going to win an election with a proposal to deliver that kind of fairness, given the way that our economy has changed um, so, so fundamentally. And so, you know, in, in a way, this is going to take, I think, a few years. It may even take two terms of government. But I'm now more confident than I've ever been before that the political wind is, is blowing in this direction because people aren't stupid. You know, they can see what happens. They can see sales of super yachts and Rolls Royces and luxury cars, and they know that it's wrong when they live in communities like, like mine where you know, you've got food bank collection boxes in the reception of the primary school because the food banks in the local community have run out of food again. You know, people know that our economy is going wrong, and that's my hope for the creation of civic capitalism too. I mean, I genuinely think now, in fact, I can prove it because we polled on this, we found that 70% of pension savers would switch their pension savings from an investment manager that wasn't doing the right thing, even if that meant a lower rate of return on their pension savings. So people are good, but at the moment, it's really difficult to be good in a way that changes the way that our economy works and a way that delivers fairness in our society. Great, thank you. Just before I go back to the room, uh, I wanted to ask Mike and Katie whether you have questions or comments. I just had a, a, a reflection on the point you made about the public opinion, the public interest and populism and all that. I just wanted to share some work of colleagues in the Department of Sociology and in the EII about people have been studying and doing focus groups but also ethnographic studies of what it's like to be living in really poor areas, the kind of areas that Katie was talking about and Liam was talking about, and that particular attitudes towards politics. One of the themes which comes over very strongly in a lot of this work, and I'm thinking of studies in Corby and Mansfield and Margate and Oldham, these are really poor areas, uh, Luna Brooksburg is here who studied Tunbridge Wells, is a sense of... Um, the feeling is all politicians are corrupt. The system, the system is broken. 
uh, is a feeling that whatever you try and do, you introduce a wealth tax, people will just think, oh, it's, just, it's not going to work, it's just, people will get around it. There is a really crucial issue about rebuilding public trust mm. in politics generally. And that is best done, I think, for using this, you know, the, the more expansive approach which Liam champions here, which is about rebuilding a public a sense of public well-being and the public and the welfare state, rather than simply one-off policy proposals. So I think, you know, we, there is a lot to do um, in terms of actually translating the frustration and the anger and the sense of hopelessness which exists in many poor communities into the feeling we can actually make a difference. But I do think you know, there is a lot to play for, and I think that the, the proposals are really important, which lead those out. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would really echo that. We see very much the same in a lot of the kind of public attitudes work that we have done. But actually, it's not just the poorest communities where you see that sense mm. of um, politics sort of being broken and this kind of lack of trust. It's, it's pretty pervasive, actually. Um, but I do think there's kind of a, there's an opportunity at the moment because. In some of the work that we've done around um, sort of people who are going without essentials, when we've done public attitudes work, sort of some big polling, lots of focus groups, when we've talked to people, that sense of kind of moral outrage that there is such widespread hardship in a country like ours is very real. And actually people don't have to go that many, that far down their social connections, only like a couple of steps removed before they're into, well, I know a friend of a friend who's been in this situation, who's had that problem, who's had to use a food bank, who's, you know, whatever it might be. And so I think it's, it's very visceral and it's very real for people at the moment in the sort of wake of the cost of living crisis. And I do think that kind of creates an opportunity to then sort of think about that coalition of how you do connect that conversation with one about wealth and start to think about, well, how could this look different? And if we were to raise some money through wealth taxes in these ways, how could we use that to make improvements? for people, um, uh, you know, the sort of back, the much bigger number of people. And I think um, the other thing as well, I think, to make a sort of small political point um, that may interest you, um, is that when we spoke to people, this was a couple of months ago, but they were very strongly of the view that they were not hearing either of the political parties sort of talking with the kind of empathy and compassion and seriousness that they think... Um, the cost of living crisis and people going without essentials uh, deserves. So I think there's a real sort of desire and appetite for it that's sort of there to be, there to be taken. Yeah, if I, if I, if I can just add though, I mean, the, for, for those who have not seen it, the, the work that JRF and Trust of Trust have done on what was called the, what they call the essentials guarantee is one of the best bits of public policy that I've, I've seen emerge in, in the last few years. And it's, you know, it's not cheap. It's about 22 billion, I think. Was the Plus just come down slightly just, recently. Just come down a little bit, so just under, under 22 billion. But I mean, if you think about the overall cost of universal credit, it's about 70, 80 billion, mm -hmm. I think. When you then look at the fiscal welfare, the tax breaks that go to people with assets, that's about 70 billion. You know, and we never kind of talk about that. But the way that Trussell and JRF have, have developed this research, good polling, good focus group work, framing it around essentials, that, that is a real model for the way that I think a lot of these public policy proposals can be developed. I think that's it, it's make it tangible, yeah. make it real to people's lives. Exactly. Thank you. Back to the questions in the room. Um, there was a lady here who had had, had her hand up from before. And other hands, lady with the black sweater and glasses. And ladies first, come on. Yes, We'll come back to more after start discussing with you. Thank you so much for, um, yeah, just a really beautiful panel. Um, I, my name is Maria. I'm coming from the UK Baha'i um, Office of Public Affairs, where we conduct um, research and policy advice about um, socioeconomic inequality. It's one of our big projects now. And one of the things that we've been looking at is this idea of um, a, a knowledge revolution because actually when we look at like the intrinsic problems in our society right now that you've actually highlighted quite well, which is this breakdown of social bonds, of trust between institutions, individuals, and communities at every level of society, I do think it comes down to a lot of the, uh, and when we talk to people, it does come back down to this idea of like reframing and restructuring a conceptual framework about how we think about human nature, about identity, 
how our economic models founded on this idea that human beings are self-serving, self-interested units that act completely in self-interest and don't really regard any other kind of social actors within that calculation that they're making um, about how to accumulate wealth and income and how to spend that in society. And actually, um, a lot of what happens when we bring in ideas of morality within that conversation is that people feel quite fortified to make decisions that are good for the collective. Um, and conversations about how communities build um, the skills that are necessary to look at like their reality and actually feel empowered to take action based on the knowledge that they've derived from their own investigation of truth and act on that. And I, I just wonder what you think and what kind of aspects of the knowledge revolution as such that actually need to be highlighted within institutions to rebuild those social bonds within people, but also to enable individuals and communities to feel that sense of empowerment to, to take their the fortunes of their own development into their own hands um, and not feel yeah, disempowered or feel like they have to rely on, on yeah, institutions that they don't feel any trust in at the moment. Thank you. Since the microphone's on this side of the room, shall we have Lila next and then we'll move over to the other side. Hi, Luna Glucksberg, I, I. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more. Um, you know, when we talk about wealth inequality and asset distribution, we know that all of those things are very heavily gendered. We know that women are hugely overrepresented in lower class, lower quality jobs, part time, zero hours, because of their caring responsibilities. Well, caring responsibilities that often end up falling on women. Their pension pots are lower. Um, could you speak a little bit to that and tell us what you would suggest to do about that, please? Thank you. Thank you. And you already have the mic. Um, thank you for your talk. That was really interesting. Um, my name is Anna. I'm reading law here at um, the LSE. And what I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit more about was um, how you spoke about one of the crucial things that we need to improve on nationally is the number and the access to knowledge intensive jobs and the fact that it's very centered kind of within the um, London and the Southeast. But, you know, generally and stereotypically, those knowledge intensive jobs that are going to put you into the higher tax brackets require a higher level of tertiary education. But then to access that tertiary education, you need a higher level of educational achievement pre-18, you know, LSE's, you know, acceptance rate, minimum straight A's, if not above. And a very small minority of 16 to 18 year olds are even capable of, of achieving that intellectually, academically speaking, and even fewer have the resources around them to actually achieve those grades. But then even once those students do get to a university like this, and I'm sure you'll know from being at Harvard and Oxford, there are even more barriers in place, you know, socially being working class in a university that's dominated by privilege. Financially, you know, Oxbridge don't allow their students to work during term time. London is an extremely expensive city. And so there's so many barriers that socially mobile students and Gen Zers have to overcome in, in order to get to those knowledge intensive positions and, and careers. But then once they're there, rightly or wrongly, you know, those working class students and those socially mobile young people aren't going to want to be voting for a politician or a political party that is then going to tax that and is then going to take that away because of the amount of barriers that they've had to overcome to break that class ceiling that they were born into. And so what I wanted to hear your insight about was what sort of granular solutions do you propose that will help improve access to education and the sorts of educational institutions that are going to lead young people into those knowledge intensive careers and those higher income and higher earning professions? Great, thank Brilliant. you. Liam, just to give you a chance to respond. Just very briefly. So on um, the knowledge revolution point, thank you, I'm going to defer slightly to the... Um, world's leading expert in sociology next to me um, for a moment, but the, the, the literature on the evolution of cooperation is just supremely important. We couldn't put lots of it in the book, 
Um, but some of it goes into a Fabian pamphlet I did about how the left takes back the argument about freedom because what, what the literature basically just helps us understand is that each and every one of us, we're a parliament of instincts. We have both a thirst for autonomy, but actually we also have pronounced needs for security, like all mammals. And so what, what politics has got to kind of help deliver is both a cooperation that delivers security, but also that kind of freedom that lets you live out that autonomy in the way that you choose. And, you know, what Katie's brilliantly exposed, what I've, I've helped expose is that the way that we cooperate together to provide that security that makes those freedoms real is collapsing now in our country. And so we've got to now kind of rebuild the fabric of social security. We've got to rebuild public services, but we've also got to democratize access to wealth because it is through wealth that we actually foster a deeper sense of security at the moment. So in, in a way, the book is a, a long plea to, to reinvent the policy architecture for cooperation. It's something that we do in the wake of massive global warfare, but it's not something that we've done particularly well um, for the last kind of 40 or 50 um, years. So on gender and race, I would say the book is too light on that, um, but one of the ways that I try and get into it is just by highlighting the fact that um, the, the way that we organise entitlements, auto enrolment is a great example. So the way that we organise auto enrolment pensions, for example, it only kicks in at a certain income level. Well, that excludes predominantly women from the auto enrolment system. So the way that our kind of wealth accumulation systems work at the moment is deeply um, offensive, and we've got to begin universalising those entitlements. And that's a long way of saying the book doesn't really get into too much on the need to rebuild public services, but also the need to rebuild social security. There are other <laughs> Fabian pamphlets available by Lee and Byrne on those topics as well um, that I can point in your direction. But I would say, if I was being self-critical, I would say the book is still too light on race, and I would say it's still too light on gender, and it's too light on intersectionality too. And I know you've got some really important work underway on that. Um, and Anna, that kind of brings me to your question really, which is that, again, something I wrote for the SMF a few years ago um, is, is a better answer for your question. I don't think I agree with the point about how antipathy to tax increases as people go up the, um, up the earnings ladder. I think actually we just need to get a lot smarter with tax. And the Wealth Tax Commission did the world a huge service by actually getting into some of the details, rather than just talking about wealth tax in the round, it began saying, well, look, what happens if you equalise capital gains tax and income? By the way, like that radical socialist Nigel Lawson. You know, the way that you frame some of these things has a really big impact. But the, the, the point I really wanted to underline in your remarks is that unless we build good democratic systems for lifelong learning, then this inequality of wealth that we've got today is about to become so much more extreme because awesome AI is going to wipe out probably more jobs than the shutdown of the steel industry and the coal industry put together, many of those will be working class jobs. But that is happening at the same time as those with wealth are inventing phenomenal new wealth management techniques to keep the wealth in the generation. And people like Brooke Harrington, who's a, an economic anthropologist at um, Dartmouth, have just done some extraordinary work on this. But un unless we get a grip of this problem now, you you're about to see wealth inequality dramatically accelerate because we don't have the kind of systems that deal with the um, brilliantly articulated concerns that you've highlighted. Did you, yeah. well, just, just thank you for the point about um, gender, gender and race and, and Liam's response. Yeah, these really, are really crucial issues, and I think we need to have a much bigger understanding of the gravity of these divides. And I'm pleased to say some colleagues, including some in the, in the room, are working precisely on these. But I think Liz Mann is back. I think, I think the latest figure we have is around you know, the wealth gap. Is 40, men have 40% more wealth than women. You know? massive, massive difference. The racial wealth divide even, even bigger. And the Money Me Trust came up with this figure of white households and having 10 times as much wealth as black African households and Bangladeshi households. So, these are, so my, my takeaway for this is wealth inequality is also intensifying these other kinds of inequalities. Exactly. It, has, it has this reinforcing effect across multiple intersectional axes, if you like, which is why we need to tackle it. Um, I just wanted to pick up um, 
the point about sort of knowledge intensive jobs and access route ways to them briefly and actually just connect it back to one of the online questions about manufacturing because um, I think so there is definitely I think an awful lot in in your question about um, kind of how how you make sure there are pathways in place for people and you know it starts at it starts at preschool it starts um, as well, pretty much as soon as a baby is born you know, a lot of that gap that we see in educational attainment opens up when children are at preschool age and then it just grows from there and you know, that is a problem that has got worse post pandemic as well so I think you know it goes right back to the quality of, um, of sort of early years support and family support and development and childcare um, and, and it sort of goes from there and I think as you sort of move up through school I think certainly thinking about alternative routes into some of these jobs is a, is a good thing to be thinking about so you know sort of mm. higher level apprenticeships can be a great pathway into some knowledge intensive jobs it doesn't always have to be university and that sort of opens up options for people but clearly there's still an awful lot that we're not getting right in the sort of parity of esteem between those two pathways um, and I think universities themselves have a huge responsibility as well I think and you know there's sort of there tends to be sort of lots of programs and sort of pathways in place now, but I think really sort of universities seeing themselves as actors within their local communities and actually using that to be talking to children when they're really quite young, actually, about um, sort of the sort of route way through university and what that can mean and what that can lead to, I think is a really important part. I think we sort of quite often leave it to quite late in the, when children are sort of teenagers when actually I think that could, that could start a lot younger. Um, but just to sort of pick up the point about manufacturing briefly, I think it's quite, it's quite interesting because I do think we have a slight tendency to be a little bit romantic and misty-eyed sometimes about jobs of the past. Um, and, you know, I think we have to remember a lot of, a lot of those jobs were, you know, were pretty dirty, pretty dangerous. Um, they were also pretty unionised, which um, did some, could in some circumstances make for much better, um, obviously, paying conditions. And I think maybe it's that that we need to sort of hold on to. It's about sort of how you um, empower employees to um, be in, um, in dialogue with employers in order to drive up standards in the workplace rather than necessarily thinking we have to sort of revert back to some kind of earlier industrial structure. That said, there clearly are some very like, brilliant jobs in um, high-value manufacturing. Um, you know, these can be great jobs. They don't tend to be huge employers, but they can be great jobs. Um, and I think um, the, other, the other side of it that we may want to think about as well is kind of that sort of question of security of um, sort of supply chains in key areas, uh, which I think is, again, sort of from sort of a global, a sort of national security point of view is something that's worth thinking about that may lead us to think slightly differently about manufacturing compared to what has been the case in recent decades. Thank you so much. So I think between the uh, presentation, the book, the discussion, we've got a pretty good roadmap now and it remains to ask Liam how the Labour Party is going to get us down <laughs> this road. <laughs> Someone had to ask. Uh -huh. Some Someone closing ask. comments on that, <laughs> on Mike's question also at the end of his presentation. So it's, a, it's, it's maybe a good point on, on which to conclude. Um, and, you know, the, the, the book is deliberately an attempt to, to, to reflect back on many of the things that I believed when I started in politics back in the early 90s. Um, it's a reflection on what I think Labour got right and, and what Labour got wrong in, in office. Um, it is a reflection on how some of our thinking about economics has changed and, and needs to change further. But I suppose you know, the, the, the starting point for it is actually the founding book of progressive politics, which is John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And, and Bunyan has this great analogy where he talks about the importance of both uh, hope and fear. Hope is what gives you energy, and fear is what gives you caution. The, the, the book is a cry of warning more than anything else, which is that if we don't get our act together soon, any measure of equality this century is about to become impossible. And that will have profound effects on our politics. One of the people who influenced me a lot in this book is Ben Ansell at Oxford, who delivered the Reef Lectures, who makes a really important point, which is that if you look at those places that voted for Brexit, that voted for Le Pen, 
that voted for the far right in Scandinavia and voted for Trump. They are the places where the growth in wealth was left behind. Now, if you think about the wealth inequality that is to come, the populism that we have today is as of nothing to the kind of divisive populism that we will have in the future. That's the cry of warning, if you like. But the plea for hope is that the future will bring great possibilities. And what we have to do as good people who care about the future is think about how we harness those opportunities, not just for some, but for all. This is not a book for a manifesto at the next election. It is a project for a three-term government. And all of my experience in government tells me that unless you start work on that kind of project on day one of a new administration, then the opportunity is lost. So it is written as a provocation. It's written as a provocation to good people to get involved in our political life, not to turn your back on it, but to kind of get stuck in. Because what is at stake is too important for you not to be involved. And I hope this book contributes a little bit of inspiration in getting stuck in. <laughs>